can turn in your King James Bible to the book of Ezra. I want to talk to you today about mingling the holy seed of Israel. Um, I had this sermon written up probably about a week ago before this whole attack on Israel thing happened. And, and um, you know, I realized that things are unfolding on a daily basis, probably on an hourly basis with what's going on over there in this war that has been declared. Um, so this is not some kind of a anti-Israel tirade or whatever else or, you know, things like that. But the Bible says, I think it's in the book of Isaiah, that you're to raise up your voice like a trumpet and show my people there, you know, in context, it's the Jews, Israel, show my people their sin and spare not. So that's what I'm going to be doing today. Um, but to Ezra chapter nine, uh, before we start reading in the scriptures and before we start the sermon I want to open up with a word of prayer uh, dear Heavenly Father uh, our thoughts and prayers go out to the saved brethren that are in Israel and the saved Jewish brethren that are here in America um, and I know Lord that your word says that you're going to gather the children of Israel back to their land in Ezekiel chapter 36 and I do believe that that prophecy is to be taken very seriously and uh, there's some other very hard prophecies that a lot of people don't want to accept about the end times. And um, you're preparing that nation over there, Lord, for the biggest events that will ever happen in the history of the world. So I pray that people would submit themselves to what the scriptures say and not what uh, would make them fit in with people and make them popular. And um, Lord, please help me to do this sermon correctly in the right spirit. And I pray that people would stop their prejudices and that they would actually look at what the scriptures teach and not go with modern uh, mind-controlled, brainwashed thinking um, that has turned people, the public school system that has turned people against your word. But I pray that we would be politically incorrect, so to speak, and uh, follow your word, what, no matter what it costs. And I ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Is Ezra uh, chapter 9. I don't know if I said Ezekiel earlier, but Ezra, the book of Ezra chapter 9. We're going to start out here in verse 1. Now when these things were done, the princes came to me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations. Even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Melbites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. Right? They're supposed to stay separate. That's what happened with the Tower of Babel. Separate. Go your separate ways. God doesn't want integration. He wants segregation. That's been there. We'll talk about this through the study. I mean, this, you look through these passages, there's no way to get around that. It's not based on hatred. It's not based on racism that one race is superior to the other. That's not what biblical segregation is all about. It's about saying, preserve how God created you. Unless you believe that the races were created by the devil. Right? I believe God created racial distinctions and things and the beauty of different cultures and things like that. It's a beautiful thing. But people say, oh, no, we, we need to eliminate that. Well, then you're working for the devil. Very plain. Verse 2. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that, here we go, the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers hath been chief in this trespass. What is a trespass? Forgive us our trespasses and our sins. It's sin. Another word for sin. So here's, here's how integrationists work. Integrationists will look for exceptions to overthrow the rule. All right? This is not one, an exception here. This is the rule for the Old Testament Jews. You're supposed to stay separate. You're not supposed to go and marry people from other races. Whatever you want to call it. I get into the thing. Well, race isn't a Bible word. Okay, nation, tongue, people, you know, kindred, whatever. They're not supposed to go and intermingle. You've mingled there. The, the Holy Seed have mingled themselves. Right there it is. I don't know how people don't get that. They say, oh, it's just about idol worship. Okay, then you, why would they write that there? Why would this be written? Just say, hey, the ones of, you know, the the interracial marriages here or whatever else, the, the mingled seed, um, the ones that are worshiping idols, put them away, but the rest, it's perfectly fine. That's not what it's saying. 
And if you read the context of what goes on here, they have a huge divorce where the men put away their wives and their children. Oh, so are you saying, you come to your own conclusions. I'm just telling you what the Bible says right here in the book of Ezra, chapter 9. Well, what about Ruth? What about Moses? What about blah, blah, blah? So you're using the exception to overthrow the rule. We'll talk about it here in this study. Um, verse 3, And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard and sat down astonished. Then were assembled unto me everyone that trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the transgression of those that had been carried away. And I, eat, and I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. Interesting thing there. Then were assembled unto me everyone that trembled at the words of the God of Israel. Do you tremble at this book? Or is this book just kind of a thing that you can just kind of go through and say, well, I'll study it so I can find exceptions to rules so that I can get away with sin. I can say, well, you know, David committed adultery and well, you know, okay, I, I might have a porn addiction and, you know, I'm, I've gone through a few marriages, but David was greatly loved of the Lord. You're not trembling at the word of God. See, this book is about a perfect man, the Lord Jesus Christ. God manifest in the flesh. And it's also about man and that man has been a consistent failure. Every man at his best state is altogether vanity. There's none good. No, not one. They're all gone away. They're all corrupt. They're... See? Man is bad. God is good. Man is a sinner. God is perfect. That's what the book is about. So if you want to go through and find companions to justify your sin, they're all through the book. Absolutely. But when there's rules given and God says, this is the way I intend it to be. And then man breaks those rules. You don't say, well, because man, man broke the rules, then I can break them too. No, you look at what God created and what God intended. See, you can say, I don't see any differences between races. Well, then you must be colorblind. And you must not appreciate other cultures. I appreciate other cultures. There's beautiful African cultures over there in, in Africa. Beautiful cultures down in cent or, uh, South America. The Peruvian people and things like that. Beautiful wool, you know, type of clothing that they make and things. Bright collars and whatever. Neat things over in Japan. Spin the silk into, you know, all this beautiful clothing and things. They're traditional cultures. And go to India. They have beautiful culture there. See, I see distinction. I see differences. I look and I say, wow, God created such beautiful things different cultures and peoples and things like that. And I don't want to blend it all together and make it this one amalgamated mess called the New World Order. I'm not interested in that. I want to stay separate from other cultures. I want to preserve my own. Not because I'm a racist. Not because I think I'm better than everybody else. I'm different. You see, that's the difference here. I'm not going to mingle my seed with some other race, some other culture. I'm not going to do it. Oh, we shouldn't have culture. We shouldn't have races. Well, you're a little bit dense. And you don't understand the scriptures. This drives me crazy, these people. Oh, it's your racist down there. Whatever. Can't help you. Verse 5. And at the evening sacrifice, I rose up from hev my heaviness, and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God, and said, O my God, I am ashamed and blushed to lift up my face to thee. My God, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass is grown up unto the heavens. Since the days of our fathers have we been in a great trespass unto this day? And for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hands of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, and to a spoil, and to confusion of face, as it is this day. And now for a little space grace hath been showed from the Lord our God, to leave us a remnant to escape, and to give us a nail in his holy place, that our God may lighten our eyes, and give us a little reviving in our bondage. For we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia, to give us a reviving, to set up the house of our God, and to repair the desolations thereof, and to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. And now, O our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments. 
What's he talking about? He's talking about mingling their holy seed. Well, no, no, it's about idol worship. Where is it talking about idol worship? Back to verse 2. Uh, so the, for they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. It's interracial marriage. It's what it is. If you don't like it, well, then you, don't have, a, you have a problem with the word of God. It's just that simple. I just don't get it, how people don't understand this. Um, which thou hast commanded by thy servants the prophets, saying, The land which unto which ye go to possess it, it is, is an unclean land with the filthiness of the people of the lands, with their abominations, which have filled it with from one end to another with their uncleanness. Now therefore give not your daughters unto their sons, neither take their daughters unto your sons, nor seek their peace or their wealth forever, that ye may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. Where does it say anything about idol worship? All the integrationists I run into, it's just about idol worship. That's, that's all that God condemned. No, he did not. Right in this passage. And again, you can give your, where's the exception to this? You know, down therefore, give not your daughters unto their sons, neither take their daughters unto your sons. Unless, you know, you, you still maintain me as your God. It doesn't say that. See, this weird philosophical way of coming to the Bible. Well, I can prove that there were exceptions where times people did go with the other daughters from other lands. and They did do this and they did do that. Yeah, because they were disobeying what God commanded. Don't you get it? And God has enough mercy and enough grace to say, okay, I'm not going to destroy you, even though you transgressed what I originally created. This is not my will. Verse 13. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that thou, our God, hast punished us less than our iniquities deserve, and hast given us such deliverance as this. And that's the testimony of any Christian, by the way, too. God has punished us less than our iniquities deserve. Always remember that. Verse 14. Should we again break thy commandments and join in affinity with the people of these abominations? Shouldest not thou be angry with us till thou, thou hadst consumed us, so that there should be no remnant nor escaping? O Lord God of Israel, thou art righteous, for we remain yet escaped as it is this day. Behold, we are before thee in our trespass, for we cannot stand uh, before thee because of this. Oh, it's just your opinion. It's just your opinion. No, it isn't. And if you go to Ezra chapter 10, we're not going to go through the whole chapter there, but if you read through Ezra chapter 10, it literally gets, gets to the end of it, and it's listing the sons and the different guys. And it says here, Ezra 10, verse 18, And, and among the sons of the priests uh, there were found that had taken strange wives, namely of the sons of, and it goes down through, it starts naming them all. But uh, they're putting away their, the wives, in verse 44, Ezra 10, verse 44, and these had taken strange wives, and some of them had wives by whom they had children. And they put them away. Now, you know, again, oh, it's just because the wives, they, they had a different religion and thing. Then why would you put the children away? The children of those marriages. See, it doesn't make any sense. If you want to make that all about idol worship, God's saying national divorce. Matthew chapter 19. Let's go to the New Testament now. Matthew chapter 19. And there's a very important reason for this sermon. It isn't just to, oh, stay away from interracial marriage and whatever else. Oh, no, no. There's some judgment coming in the future that is specifically because of the sins of Israel. Because they've mingled the holy seed. We'll see about the proof of that. Matthew chapter 19, verse 1 through 8. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coasts of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh? Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. 
What therefore God hath joined us together, let not man put asunder. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement to put her away? See? You see how it works? You see how lost religious people do this? Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Jesus says, well, at the beginning, God made it that a man and wife are supposed to come together. And they're not supposed to part. Well, then why did Moses write it down? Ah, oh, you see? God says, hey, don't give your daughters and, and sons to their, you know, back and forth. Stay with your own people. And, it, you know, my whole, my interracial marriage study that I did, I go through all the scriptures about the thing of interracial marriage. Show it. It's not just what I read there in Ezra. That's all through the New or all through the Old Testament. Definitely, it's there. But, but, what about same thing that the Pharisees are doing right here? Verse eight. He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. Did you get that? Because of the hardness of your heart, Moses wrote that. Put that thing in there that you can have a writing of divorcement. But from the beginning, it wasn't so. It's not what God intended. Genesis chapter 3. I'll show you specifically what the Lord is talking about here. From the beginning. Genesis chapter 3. And uh, beginning in verse 14, verse 14 and 15 is what we will read here. It says, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and, ab and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Hmm. So the Lord gives a prophecy here that there would be a future seed from the woman, and that that seed would, would uh, bruise his head, bruise the devil's head. So now, um, do you think the devil might want to go after that seed? Mingle it? Mess it up? Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Genesis chapter 9. So the devil's looking and he's saying, okay, you know, between my seed and her seed. Hmm, that's kind of broad. But then the Lord narrows it down after the flood. Genesis chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. Huh. Um... God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. To finish the three different sons, the unique racial prophecy for each one. Kindred, tongue, people, nation, whatever you call it. Okay, don't get all excited. People out there try to find anything that they can, you know, to loophole what I say, too. Interesting. But uh, verse 26, blessed be the Lord God of Shem. It doesn't say blessed be the Lord God of Ham or Canaan. It doesn't say blessed be the Lord God of Japheth. So, if you understand what the Bible teaches, Japheth is the ancestor of the white Europeans. Ham is the ancestor of the African Indian type people, in other words, India Indian. And then Shem is the father of the Oriental. And that would be the, include the Native American people of North America and South America as well. So, there are three different sons and each one gets his own prophecy. But now the devil can see that that Seed is going to come through Shem. Now, do you think the devil might try to go after that seed then? Get them to mingle their seed and to destroy the holy seed of the people of Israel? Yes. That's what the devil has been involved with for a very long time. Mark chapter 10. Go back to the New Testament. You just you have to understand... The Bible runs contrary to what you're taught in public school and on television and whatever else. It's, the Bible can't be reconciled with what goes on out there in terms of what you can just get along or whatever else. No, you can't. Mark chapter 10 
um, verses 1 through 9. And he arose from thence, and cometh into the coast of Judea, by the farther side of Jordan. And the people resort unto him again. And as he was wont, he taught them again. And the Pharisees came to him, and asked him, Is it, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife, tempting him? Again, see, they're tempting him. It's not a, a real honest question. And a lot of the questions that I've been getting on my studies where I come out and I say about biblical segregation, a lot of it's just questions that try to tempt me. And I can spot that. It isn't some kind of a thing. And, hey, I'm really truly asking in humility. We hear, what about this verse? What about that? It's this thing of tempting me, trying to corner me and, and get me. And so, so I can say, well, okay, yeah, I guess it's okay and whatever else. I'm not going to say that. As tough as it is to take a stand for this, I'm going to take a stand because it's what the Bible teaches. Verse 3, And he answered and said unto them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh, so that... They are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. God has a purpose. I've joined them together. Don't put it asunder. Period. Well, yeah, but we have, the, you know, I don't really like my wife, and we're not really getting along, and I think I should probably get a divorcement. Well, okay, there's provisions for getting a divorce in the scriptures, you see? But that's not what God's plan is. Marry the right person. Then you don't need to get a divorce. And be a real man and take responsibility for your actions and take responsibility for your wife's actions and say, you know what? A lot of her problems actually are probably me slipping up. Me lowering the defenses of this family. Me compromising and listening to the wrong kind of music. Me compromising and listening or watching the wrong kind of things on television or the computer or whatever else. Maybe her problems are actually my fault. Maybe I better take responsibility for these things. Oh, well, it's just easier to get a divorce and you go out and you get another wife, you know. And another wife if that one fails. And another wife and another wife. Exodus 28. Back to Exodus, Exodus chapter 28. God never intended for anybody to get divorced. He allows it but he never intended it. And I'll tell you right now, God never intended anybody to mingle their seed. I don't believe in it. Oh, 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 I just can't believe it. This is hatred. And whatever. It's not hatred. It's not hatred at all. Exodus chapter 28, verse 40 through 43. And for Aaron's sons thou shalt make coats, and thou shalt make them for them girdles, and bonnets shalt thou make for them, for glory and for beauty. And thou shalt put them upon Aaron thy brother and his sons with him, and shalt anoint them, and consecrate them, and sanctify them, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness, from the loins even unto the thighs they shall reach." Um, and they shall be upon Aaron and upon his sons when they come in unto the tabernacle of the congregation or when they come near unto the altar to minister in the holy place that they bear not iniquity and die. It shall be a statute forever unto him and his seed after him. Okay. Um, the priests are to preserve their holy seed. That's a very important thing to God. They're given the command there. It's supposed to be to him and his seed. Don't mess around with other you know, strange wives and outlandish women and things that cause you to sin, cause you to get into other gods. Well, you can you can mess around with out, other outlandish women as long as they, you know, accept your God or whatever else. Where does the Bible say that? Well, you know, I can show the, it's this thing here and this thing there. And then it contradicts. You make the Bible contradict. Again, understand the difference between God's standards that he originally wrote, and then man's sin, and God says, okay, I'm going to allow a writing of divorcement. I'm going to allow this thing of, I'm going to bless a marriage here, or bless this people here, even though they married outside of their tongue people nation. Well, because of the exception, then we can overthrow the rule. Yeah. Um, 
Isaiah chapter 1. Let's go there. Isaiah chapter 1. Getting there. Isaiah chapter 1. Um, verse Beginning in verse 1. I need to put a thing over this. I keep getting my losing my place here. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1 through 6. The vision of Isaiah the son of Amoz, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Oh, except for, you know, when they married outside of their holy seed there. That's not re rebellion against God. I don't think so. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers. Huh. You think that could be a reference to physical seed of evildoers that has entered in? Children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head, there is no soundness in it. But wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, they have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Would God have said this of a people that had remained pure? that had preserved the holy seed, that never allowed anybody else to come in, that had truly been separated. We want to stay separate. Sorry, not marrying these heathen people in the area here. And we're not going to give up our God. But every time they start to marry people from other nations, the other gods start to come in. Hmm. Go to Isaiah 6. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9 through 13. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Be make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. It's an amazing statement there. We'll get into this as we continue. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. And the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. But yet in it shall be a tenth, and it shall return, and shall be eaten as a teal tree, and as an oak, whose substance is in them, when they cast their leaves. So the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. There's coming a remnant in the future that will be considered a holy seed. But a lot of them are going to be cut off. The others that have corrupted themselves. Hmm. It's almost like a reference to the time of Jacob's trouble. When God wipes out a lot of the min mingled people. Oh, now this is stretching it. God doesn't care about race. God doesn't care. He doesn't care. We'll see. Matthew chapter 13. You're so arrogant, Brian. You're just so arrogant. You think that you're right. And you, you know, it's about the Bible. The strict standards of the Scriptures. Matthew chapter 13, verse 14 through 15. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. What we just read. Jesus is referring back to that. Which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Back in the book of Isaiah, it's about the Lord healing them, and now the Lord says, now Jesus says, I should heal them. Why? Because he's the Lord. <laughs> because he's God. Hmm. So kind of an interesting thing there, how that the Lord quotes the book of Isaiah. And it's 
again, what do you do with this when you get into the whole hyper soul winning thing? You have to just be out there just knocking doors and, you know, talking to everybody you meet and whatever else. Uh, Jesus says, you know, I don't want these people to, to know and to hear and whatever else because I don't want to convert them, <laughs> you know. Um, I mean, look what it says there. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. I'm going to make these people that they don't understand because I don't want them to be saved. Huh? Yeah, there are people that can get that wicked. People that can get that horrible. You say, oh, interracial. No, I didn't say that. What I'm saying is the Jews, the nation of Israel there, the prophecy is that it gets worse and worse with time. They're not getting better. And why is it getting worse? Keep having a problem going away from the Bible and going away from God. Acts chapter 28. And we'll see here that uh, Paul also quotes from Isaiah. Go to Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28, verse 24 through 29. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. Paul's speaking to the Jews here. And when they departed, or excuse me, when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word, well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, according to Isaiah, Isaiah again, saying, Go unto this people, and saying, Hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Uh, be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed, and had great reasoning among themselves. I'm sure... Some real great reasoning about that. Go to Malachi, last book in the Old Testament. The book of Malachi. If you go to Zechariah, you've gone too far. Turn back to the towards the New Testament. Malachi chapter 2. And again, oh, God is all for integration. He's all for interracial marriage, the whole thing. He's okay with it. As long as they just continue to serve him, he's fine with it. He doesn't view it as a great evil or great trespass, even though Ezra 9 says that. Um, you know, we'll just say that it's it, Ezra 9 was about idol worship or something like that, even though it never says that in the passage. Um, and they are divorcing their wives and getting rid of their children because of the trespass of marrying and giving their daughters to their the sons of the heathen and taking you know their daughters for the holy seed sons and things and uh, they've corrupted the holy seed but let's not talk about that i mean what better way for the devil to try and stop jesus christ from coming and being with the jews than to get rid of the jews through mingling them with other people I mean, how do you really define racism Somebody like me that wants to see races preserved and say, wow, it's beautiful, I love your culture and whatever else. I'm a racist, but people that say, no, we want to eliminate culture, we want to eliminate and, and just miscegenate everybody. I would say that that's more racist than what I believe. I don't look down on other people. I don't look down on other races. Malachi chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. Remember what we read Earlier there in um, uh, Exodus chapter 28, verses 40 through 43, about the, you know, Aaron and his sons, his seed that comes after him. They're supposed to really keep themselves pure. Verse 2, If ye will not hear, and if ye will not lay it to heart, to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already, because ye, did, ye do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will corrupt your seed, letting them get away with it, um, and spread dung upon your, upon your faces, even the dung of your solemn feasts, and one shall take you away with it. 
And ye shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you, that my covenant might be with Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him of life and peace, and I gave them to him for the fear with wherewith he feared me. Remember the Bible talked earlier about all those that trembled at the word of God and was afraid before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth, and iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity, and did turn many away from iniquity. That's the job of a preacher, a priest in the Old Testament, a preacher today, a pastor, whatever you want to call the, the man of God that's supposed to be sharing the word of, of God. Turn many away from iniquity. That's what I try to do. Try to turn people away from iniquity. If you get some preacher and some hireling in these Babel buildings, they're not trying to turn you away from iniquity, then it's not really a, he's not really a preacher of God. Verse 7, For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But ye are departed out of the way, ye have caused many to stumble at the law, ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people, according as ye have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. I mean, <laughs> it's just this whole thing, you're being partial in the law. You start to respect persons. You, I don't want to offend so-and-so because, you know, the way they married or whatever. I don't want to offend certain people. You're being partial in the law. You're being a man-pleaser. Verse 10. Have we not all one Father? Hath not one God created us? Why do we deal treacher treacherously every man against his brother by profaning the covenant of our fathers? It, how do you have, okay, the, the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, how can you really claim that when you have people that are of mingled seed coming in among you as a Jew? All of a sudden, they're, you know, of Ham or of Japheth or whatever, and they pop in now. Now they get the covenant. I remember seeing a video the one time of uh, the native people here in, in Maine, the uh, Wabanaki people, I think they are down in the southern part of Maine, and they had this thing where they had this tribal dance, and they're, they're all in their, you know, leather, you know, and everything with the fringes and their native uh, outfits, their native attire, and, you know, long, dark hair among the women and things, and they're dancing along, and, and there's some blonde girl or something, you know, and she's in there dancing with them too, and she has her native gear, and I thought, yeah, that, that looks great, you know, some, you know, somebody there, a parent or somebody, one of them, I guess, married a Japhetic guy, got blonde hair, just didn't look right. Um, verse 11. Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange god. It's, it's, it's the pagan practices. It's the pagan practices. But it doesn't say that. He's married the daughter of a strange god doesn't say that she worshiped the strange God. And again, okay, she gets saved. Then what? She's part of the David, you know, Davidic covenant and the Abrahamic covenant. See, it's, just, it's so messed up. It blows my mind how people can try to justify it. The Lord will cut off the man that doeth this, the master and the scholar, out of the tabernacles of Jacob, and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. And we're going to see what happens there. Um, I'll get back to this. And this have ye done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering any more, or receiveth it with good will at your hand. Yet to the end of the Old Testament, and God's saying, I don't even listen to you anymore. I'm so sick and tired of it. You just keep going back to your sin over and over again. I mean, read through, you know, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, and just good king, bad king, good king, bad king, and they just keep it keeps going down. This guy was perfect in his ways. But he didn't take away the high places. This one here, he served the Lord, but he didn't take away some of the idolatry. And then he got prideful at the end. He went into the temple, tried to do his own thing. And they're saying, get out. And he didn't leave at first. And so he got leprosy for the rest of his life. And it just gets worse and worse and worse. Not better and better and better. They're mingling with other people and taking their gods and coming in and they're trying to make deals with money and, um, you know, whatever. By the time you have the first century, they're, they're there in captivity under the Roman legions, trying to get along with the, you know, 
all the royalty and everything else and trying to make connections and how disgusting. Uh, verse 14, yet ye say, wherefore, because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet is, yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. What's the wife of thy covenant? What does that mean? If interracial marriage is fine, you've dealt treacherously with the wife that was supposed to be there. And did not he make one? Uh, yet had he the residue of the spirit, and wherefore one, that he might seek a good, a godly seed. <laughs> He's seeking a godly seed. I, again, how do you get through this though, whole thing? You're an integrationist. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, said that he hateth, hateth putting away, for one covereth violence, violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit, that ye deal not treacherously. Ye have wearied the Lord with your words, yet ye say, Wherein have we wearied him? When ye say, Every one that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and delighteth in them, or where is the God of judgment? exactly what people say. Oh, it doesn't matter. It's not important. Whatever else. <laughs> now let's go to chapter 3 of the same book here. Malachi chapter 3 verse 1. We'll continue reading here. Behold, I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver. Hmm. And purge them as, excuse me, and that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. So God's going to do something out in the future that's going to bring it back to the way it once was. Why? Because they corrupted his way. Because they corrupted things that were originally there. Uh, verse 5, And I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, and against the adulterers, and against false swears, and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right. And fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts, for I am the Lord, I change not, Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. God made special covenants. They're there. But what's the deal with this inter, inter marriage stuff all the time? Interracial marriage there. Oh, God's all for it. Well, then you're really stretching the scriptures. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. God has plans for the future, and they're not going to make you very popular when you stand for them. That's just the way that it is. Uh, Revelation chapter 14, I mean, it's pretty much gotten to the point where if you say a certain thing, you can tell if it's of God or not by how much people get mad about it. All right, verse 1, Revelation 14, verse 1 says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads, and I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts, and the elders, and no man could learn the song, that song, but the hundred and forty and four thousand, which were redeemed from the earth. Now look at this, verse 4. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth, these were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now, what does that mean? Does it mean that uh, a man that gets married there is defiled with women, with a woman? Do you get defiled when you get married? No, of course not. What's it talking about here? I believe what it's talking about is that God is going to bring back those sons of Levi like it talked about in the book of Malachi. And I realize that there are 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. That's what it's talking about here. So it's not just the tribe of Levi. But God is going to restore a pure 
um, 144,000 Jewish men, and they're not going to marry. Why not? Because God doesn't want them to mingle their holy seed again. And they're going to serve him in the thousand-year kingdom. A pure race of men. And again, that's not what the Bible says. Okay, what's it saying here? Malachi, I'm going to purify the sons of Levi. Here they are. They're not going to defile themselves with women. God's stopping that. This mingling of the holy seed. And finally, let's go to Romans chapter 9. Might go one other place too. I'm just thinking of another verse here that I should have put in this my notes, but we'll go to Romans 9 first. Romans chapter 9. Verses 1 through 8. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have continual or that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites. There's no question who this is talking about. To whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants. Again, the covenants are there for the Israelites. What do you do when you marry somebody of strange flesh? Somebody that comes in, an outlandish woman comes in. Do they automatically get the, con the covenants given to them then? Abraham and Isaac and their seed. Their seed. And the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Not as though the word of God hath taken not hath taken on effect look at this for they are not all Israel which are of Israel huh neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children but in Isaac shall thy seed be called that is they which are the children of the flesh these are not the children of God but the children of the promise are counted for the seed so there's a spiritual thing there absolutely but it's also talking about a physical seed and there are some people that are of somewhat physical seed there, but they're not the children. They're not heirs. I mean, Abraham had two sons. Remember that, Galatians chapter 4. Okay, one other place here to go to. And this is going to be where I will end the study. Romans chapter 11, verse 11. It says here, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Speaking again about the Jews. God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Um, as I study this whole thing more and more, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, why do the Jews constantly try to pretend that they're white people? It's kind of weird. Why do they intermarry with white people? Why is it a big thing in Hollywood to marry for a Jew to marry a Catholic? What's this all about? Why is there all this mingling of the seed, the holy seed of Israel? Um, it's kind of weird. Uh, I think it's because they're jealous. They're jealous. They see a white man. And the white man is a Christian. He's born again, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. I have a greater connection to God than any Jew in the Old Testament ever had. It's a great thing. He said, well, you're boasting against the, the nation of Israel, boasting against the natural branches. No, I'm not. What I'm saying is, I have a special promise. I don't hate the Jewish people. But what I don't like is, I don't like it when they try to act like me. Because they're jealous. The Jews should not be going into banking and things like that. They shouldn't be getting into all the stuff that the white Japhetic people do. And trying to be big shots like the white people. It's getting them into trouble. But you see, they're jealous. That guy's a Christian. He's saved. He knows God, God knows him, and God blesses him. Hmm, we don't have the blessing of God anymore in terms of all the blessings. You know, the covenant is still there and everything. Um, the promises that were made to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, you know, that's there. But there's some problems because we rejected Jesus as our Messiah. 
Hmm. Well, then we'll try to pretend that we're white. We'll try to pretend that we're other people like that. And intermarry here and intermarry there and, and corrupt the holy seed to where God says, okay, stop, enough. I have to put an end to this. And brethren, that's where we're at right now. Um, there's some really hard things coming for Israel. Very hard. The uh, Palestinian people or whatever else over there, they have no right to the land. And boy, is that going to be a divisive issue. You know, what do they call from the land of the sea, Israel, Palestine will be free or something, this chant that they do? Uh, no, it won't. God is going to get the Palestinian people out of Israel. Um, it's going to happen. Whether people like it or not, it's just what's, it's going to you know, be that way. And the people are going to hate Israel even more so. You say, well, Brian, you don't make any sense here at all. You're not making any sense at all. I mean, this, this is insanity. So wait, Jews are supposed to go back to Israel, and yet you're saying Israel is going to have a lot of violence happening. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Do you believe the Bible? I do. I tremble at the word of God. And you know what? My Bible says that the Jews are supposed to go back to their land. And my Bible tells me story after story about how the Jews wrought great victories when they were fighting for their land. And that Naomi and her husband, when they went out to another land because there was a famine in the land of Israel, uh, and they gave their sons, they, they got uh, you know, uh, Moabite women for their sons. Uh, Naomi comes back and she says, it's a great sin that I did. She understands. It was a terrible mistake that she made. I've talked about the whole Ruth thing in other videos, so I'm not going to get into it here. But um, it's a controversial subject. Well, brother, you should just stay away from it then and whatever. I'm not going to do that. You see, what I want people to understand is that there's no hatred in me for the Jewish people. None. But I understand that they are out of God's will right now. And they're going around and they're corrupting their seed with other people. I don't understand how a Jew could marry a Catholic. <laughs> it just kind of blows my mind. I think, okay, uh, that doesn't really make any sense. But, And they're doing all this other stuff. Corrupting themselves. Putting God's judgment more upon themselves. And I'm saying, you know what? You need to get over there to your land. I saw a thing today that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu has been saying about how that we need to get more citizens armed and everything else and get them ready to fight. Yeah, you probably should. I'd recommend everybody having a gun over there in Israel because you're surrounded by a lot of people that hate you, but you're watched over by one that loves you. But there's a blessing there for you if you do things according to his word. If you tremble at the word of God and you say, you know what, I'm a Jew, but I better get over there because that's what the Bible says. And I don't want to, I'm not going to be ashamed of my hooked nose and my whatever other things that Jews, oh, oh, you know, I need to get rhinoplasty to make my Jew or my, my hooked nose look more like a white man's nose or something. Why? Why would you be ashamed of yourself? Well, I'm a Jew, you know, and I have, you know, I'm actually a goldsmith, you know, on my mother's side, but, you know, I don't want to talk about it. Why? Why? You're a Jew? Don't cover it up. Be thankful that you're part of a chosen, chosen race. People that have a special promise from God. Don't cover it up. Don't try to look like you're white. Don't try to look like you're black or any other race out there. Don't do that. And don't give your daughters to Japhetic sons or Hamitic sons. Don't take their daughters for your sons. Don't do that. So I'm sure that this is uh, the sermon's going to go over like a you know box of rocks or something, whatever you want to call it. Uh, not going to go over well, I'm sure, with a lot of people. But uh, you know, uh, for all the people out there that want to lie about me and say that I'm basing this all on hatred and I should be part of the Ku Klux Klan or something stupid, uh, that's not why I preach this, not at all. What I'm trying to say is the prophecies about the time of Jacob's trouble. You know, Israel, they're having some bad times coming. And God's going to judge the whole earth because of what those Jews have been doing. They've been doing some very wicked things. Oh, we're really accepting of sodomy over there in Israel. Yeah, well, you're going to see what happens. 
you're going to see what happens about that. You know, the Bible talks about in the book of Revelation, it's Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. He calls Jerusalem Sodom and Egypt. And if you understand about Jerusalem, yeah, it should be called Sodom and Egypt. The wrath of God is coming upon these people, the Jewish people. And you say, oh, it's such a contradictory thing. Wrath is coming, but I should go there. Well, because it's going to be a lot better there than it will be in other countries. The illusion of peace that's here in America for the Jewish people, um, it's going to go away. And if it's not the uh, alt-right Catholics, it's going to be uh, radical Muslims. And there's a lot more of those. Well, I shouldn't say there's a lot more Muslims. I'm not sure. They, they're always kind of competing. You know, the Catholics and the Muslims are, you know, neck at neck. You know, one point something billion, a little bit more, and then a little bit more, and a little bit less. And, you know, so... Uh, you better fear God's word and tremble at God's word and not think about, um, you know, being politically correct and fitting in and whatever else. And uh, just to, you know, say this, uh, and I could, I'm going to be going over more scriptures probably in a different study on this, but um, what God intended from the beginning, God created people to be unique. He didn't create people to be blended and all the other stuff. And uh, I got to thinking about this the other day, and I thought, you know, a lot of people, oh, brother, I'm, I'm half this and I'm half that. I guess you hate me now or something. No, I didn't say that. I didn't say that at all. Oh, I guess you think that I can't get saved. I didn't say that. Okay, a lot of people were lying about me with this whole thing. But thinking about this, and I thought, you know, my dog, I have a little rat terrier named Luther. Um, did God create Luther? Yes, he did. God gave my dog life. If uh, God said, I don't want him to be born, he wouldn't have been born. Um, but did God create a Luther type of dog, a rat terrier at the beginning? No. God's original design for canines would have been fox, coyote, wolf. Maybe there's some other wild dog breeds out there. But here in North America, it'd be fox, coyote, wolf. Well, obviously my dog Luther does not resemble a wolf or a coyote. He resembles a fox. Uh, he has a little pointy nose like a fox. He has the little pointy ears like a fox, but the tail's not the same. The collar of his body is not the same. Um, his fur is definitely not as long as a fox. My dog would not survive, you know, full-time outdoors in the wintertime. Um, how did my dog get to where he is? Through mixed breeding. Um, he's very healthy, very smart, very capable of doing things. He was bred for the purpose of killing mice, and he does a very good job at it. Um, great, wonderful, but because my dog is not the pure original strain, I'm going to kill him tonight. No, I'm not going to do that. Um, I'm going to say, this is my dog, and I'm going to feed him well, I'm going to love him and everything else. And if you're out there and you're of some kind of a, you're not originally just a pure white or pure Hamitic or pure Shemitic, um, Japhetic, I should say, at the beginning there. Uh, you're not of that pure strain? Well, okay. Um, are you a sinner? The Bible says that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And Paul said, of whom I am chief. And Paul was a pure Jew. There wasn't anything about him being mixed or anything else. And he didn't say, you know, God came, you know, Christ Jesus came into the world to save pure Jews. And that's all. He didn't say that. He said, sinners. If you're a sinner, God can save you. It's that simple. <laughs> That's the qualification that you have to meet. He said, well, yeah, I'm a sinner. Okay. Then you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Don't write to me and ask me if how your relationship is with him or whatever else. That's none of my business. None of my business. Well, he's some pure white guy or whatever else, pure Japhetic man and whatever. Well, he must be saved. Maybe not. I don't know. Is he a sinner? You see? That's how it works out. But if you wonder why God is going to be destroying uh, so many people in the future, I think that all flesh is corrupted his way. As in the days of Noah, so too shall be in the days before the coming of the Son of Man. They were marrying and giving in marriage. But yet they were going after strange flesh back then. Now they're going after strange flesh again. Mingling things. And the Jews are mingling their holy seed giving their daughters away and their sons taking daughters from the heathen of the surrounding countries. 
So don't question why God's going to be brutal. And don't question why God is going to restore a holy people in the future and say, you're not going to marry because I want you to remain holy. So all this new agey stuff and whatever, God doesn't care. There's only one race, you know, the human race. Where's the word human? It's a new age concoction, you know? I mean, why would you even use that word? I won't use it unless I'm making fun of it. It's not a Bible word. You need to get that word out of your language. It's mankind, right? <laughs> but uh, so I'll, I'll stop raving now. Either you get it or you don't. It's just as simple as that. Um, so, and you know, a lot of the philosophical questions that come out and people say, well, what about this? What about that? Whatever. Uh, what about these exceptions that overthrow the rule? Well, um, I might go through some of those in the future, but uh, whatever. <laughs> uh, you're causing the Bible to contradict. It's just that simple. Um, God puts up with sin. God has grace. He's merciful. He's long-suffering. But because people sin, that doesn't overthrow his original design. From the beginning, it was not so. So that will be it. Thank you very much for watching.